of point three, we look at data studying the amount of carbon dioxide uh, potentially removed from the air by trees. Carbon dioxide is a leading contributor to temperature change to global warming. And there's often campaigns to plant trees to reduce carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Now, two trees of the same size uh, take about the same amount of carbon dioxide out of the air to make wood. The trees convert carbon dioxide. They take, they separate the carbon from the oxygen. Carbon dioxide is carbon and oxygen combined. The trees release the oxygen, which is good for us. We breathe oxygen along with other animals. And the trees use the carbon to build cellulose and other uh, leaves, flowers, to build the tree itself. And so the carbon becomes a part of the tree. So when planting trees, basically, uh, bigger trees are going to eventually take up more carbon dioxide. But this research is a little bit more subtle. It turns out that trees also pump carbon into the ground uh, and take carbon out of the ground. They do both. They both push carbon into the ground around them, and at times they take carbon out of the ground. And so the this research that was being done by Resch, Binkley, and Perota was looking at whether the amount of carbon that goes into the ground varies with the type of tree. Again, as in most statistics exercises, you need a little background. They were focusing on two different types of trees. One are trees called nitrogen-fixing trees. These are trees in the uh, P family, as we call it, in uh, uh, Fabaceae. And comparing to whether they have any different effect on soil carbon than non-nitrogen-fixing trees. Now, to give you an idea of what trees, some trees that fall into this, an example of a nitrogen-fixing tree is the chuga and kerosene. It's in the P family. We have these on Pompeii, and these trees uh, do, uh, they, when we say fix nitrogen, we mean that they have uh, nodules in the roots containing a cyanobacteria that absorbs nitrogen. These are basically self-fertilizing trees. They produce their own fertilizer, and so they grow very quickly, and they can grow in poor soils. We call it chuga and kerosene, fast-growing, large tree. For an example of a tree that does not have nitrogen-fixing capabilities, the eucalyptus decleptic tree, a tree that we find here on Pompeii, is a tree that does not have nodules in the roots with uh, the cyanobacteria. It cannot generate its own fertilizer from the ground. It needs to absorb nitrogen produced in the ground by other organisms. So it does not self-fertilize. And the researchers were looking at whether there's a difference, this is a research article here, a difference in the amount of carbon that is stored, that is sequestered, that's what sequestration they're talking about, they mean stored in the ground, how much carbon is stored in the ground. Now, I don't have access to the original data, but I did have full access to the research, and I can see what their data produced. They can see means and standard deviations. So I've created a set of data that, that mimics their results. And uh, I've just arbitrarily placed done the study as being between 20 randomly selected rainbow gum trees in Kamar Netch. They're down in Kamar and 20 randomly selected Falcateria malacana trees in Palakur, Sokes, they're over here. These trees are not paired in any way, shape, or form. They're just two different sets of trees, two samples. Uh, and I'll get, uh, so what you're looking at, when you're looking at the spreadsheet is, these are the eucalyptus trees in column A, and in column B are the nitrogen-fixing trees, the Falcateria malacana trees. These 20 trees are in uh, Kamer, in, in Netch, 
And these are up on the campus here, the college campus. And you can see negative numbers are the soil lost carbon. They just had less carbon. This is year on year. They went and they measured how much carbon was in the soil one year, and then they came back a year later and measured how much carbon was in the soil a year later. And we can see sometimes the soil lost carbon, sometimes it gained carbon. And here we have gain, gain, loss, gain, loss. So for both types of trees, there are gains and losses. The, the research was to see if there's any difference between the two, and if there is a difference, which is the better tree to plant? That is, whichever tree can store more carbon in the ground will be considered the better tree. And so that's what this, this is now. We've got some numbers, but what does it mean? What's the story here? And when we go out to plant trees, and we're trying to maybe plant trees to help hedge against global warming and decrease carbon in the atmosphere, does it matter which kind we plant? Should we be planting non-nitrogen-fixing trees or nitrogen-fixing trees? Which of these is doing a better job, if either, at uh, carbon uh, at carbon sequestration in the soil, which would mean they put it, they get more carbon out of the atmosphere. And again, positive numbers, that's good. Negative numbers, that's not as good. That's carbon being lost from the soil. And so uh, the bigger the positive numbers, the better, and the, the bigger the negative numbers are worse. But all I've got is a pile of numbers. And both trees sometimes, you know, here's a Falcatera malacana that lost carbon from the soil. Here's a non-nitrogen-fixing tree that put more carbon in the soil over the course of a year. So that's what the units are. Kilograms of nitrogen per square meter per year, because they did this a year apart. You'll try to tell me the story of this data and tell me which tree is better. Do read through the description. It's a little long. It's a detailed explanation of what to do. But do have a look at the explanation and read through it. If you have questions, do ask. You'll be submitting a presentation, uh, and again, but you'll be doing your analysis in Google Sheets. So in order to work on it, you'll have to use file, make a copy, either from the laptop, as I'm doing here, or possibly you might be doing it from the Google Sheets app on your mobile device, uh, whichever you choose to use. You can work on this. Uh, you might also try to find a meaningful chart. Don't just graph everything. Uh, th that's not meaningful. There's a tendency to just do something like this and slap up a chart. But that doesn't... I don't know what that means. It doesn't, I'm not sure what that means. An audience looking at that will go, Oh, okay. That doesn't seem to have any particular meaning. And so that's kind of, it's confusing, and it doesn't seem to have any particular meaning. And I'm not even sure what this x-axis is. So don't just toss up a random chart. Put something that tells the story. And when people look at it, they go, oh, okay, I'm going to plant this kind of tree. That chart doesn't tell you what kind of tree to plant. You want something that tells you what kind of tree you're supposed to plant. So you want some kind of meaningful chart. So that's this week's uh, exercise. We'll be looking at these, and I'll be getting out some of the links to this. Don't forget, you've got to use file, make a copy to get an editable copy. And there's different ways to do that, whether here or on the uh, phone. But I will get out links to the data and so that you can work on the data uh, and get at the data.